tragic events are unfortunately all too common in history, take the time Canada set out to assimilate Indigenous kids into the country's dominant culture. To do that, Canadian authorities literally kidnapped thousands of children and sent them to mandatory boarding schools where they were housed in horrible conditions and were subjected to neglect and various cruelties and abuses. Thousands of innocent kids died as a result. Following are 20 things about that and other tragic historic events. Number 20. The Nazis began to target subversive youths during World War II. During World War II, the Edelweiss pirates were increasingly targeted by the Nazis. In the conflict's early years, they were blamed for collecting anti-Nazi propaganda leaflets dropped by British bombers and stuffing them into mailboxes. That was viewed as subversion during wartime and treason. In 1941, a Nazi official wrote about a subset known as the Kittelbach Pirates. Every child knows who the Kittelbach Pirates are, they are everywhere, there are more of them than there are Hitler youth, they beat up the patrols, they never take no for an answer. In 1943 authorities in Dusseldorf complained to the Gestapo that, the local Edelweiss gang was a bad influence on other youth, as well as on young soldiers, who hung out with them while on leave, the report noted, these adolescents, aged between 12 and 17, hang around late in the evening with musical instruments and young females. Since this riff-raff is in large part outside the Hitler Youth and adopts a hostile attitude towards the organization, they represent a danger to other young people. Number 19. Things got tragic for the Edelweiss pirates once they attracted Himmler's attention. Although the Nazis began to target the Edelweiss pirates, local authorities were nonetheless relatively lenient with them compared to how they dealt with adult subversives, for example penalties for the delinquents, who often kept their hair long and their appearance bohemian to set themselves apart, from the militarized regimentation all around them, were often limited to a stern warning, after which their heads were shaved. That was not enough for Heinrich Himmler, chief of the SS. He wanted an example made of youths who failed to show complete loyalty, and deemed any half-measures to be unacceptable. Once they got on Himmler's radar, things were bound to get tragic for the anti-Nazi youths. In 1942, Himmler wrote to his deputy Reinhard Heydrich that he wanted the Edelweiss pirates to do two or three year stints in concentration camps, there the youths should first be given thrashings, and then put through the severest drill and set to work, it must be made clear that they will never be allowed to go back to their studies, we must investigate how much encouragement they have had from their parents, if they have encouraged them, then they should also be put into a concentration camp. And, have their property confiscated. Number 18. In a tragic development, many of the Edelweiss pirates morphed into reactionaries after World War II. In 1944, Himmler ordered a brutal crackdown on youngsters who failed to toe the Nazi line. That November, 13 youths were hanged in public in Cologne. Many of them active or former Edelweiss pirates. The repression failed to break the youth coalition however, it continued as a defiant subculture that rejected the norms of Nazi society until the Thousand-Year Reich went down to defeat after a mere 12 years. After the war, some factions of the Edelweiss pirates attempted to work with the Allied occupation authorities and were welcomed, particularly by the communists in the Soviet-occupied zone. However, most of them true to their ethos, turned their backs on the attempt to politicize their movement, they had risked their lives to evade the regimentation of the Nazis, and were not eager to embrace regimentation under the communists in a tragic development. Those in what became communist East Germany ended up as dissidents and social outcasts, and many did long stints in prison as a result, in West Germany, in yet another tragic twist to an already tragic tale, many Edelweiss pirates ended up as reactionaries, even less reconciled to defeat than the Nazis, they became notorious for their attacks on Germans, particularly women who were friendly or intimate with occupation soldiers. Number 17. When the Germans tried to economize on the manpower necessary, to guard the Belgian-Dutch border in World War I. In World War II, Germany invaded both the Netherlands and adjacent Belgium in order to get at France from the northeast, however in the First World War, the Germans invaded only Belgium, and the Netherlands remained neutral, and left a lengthy border between the two countries, through which smugglers, spies, and saboteurs slipped back and forth, and prisoners of war escaped to freedom. By the end of 1914, over a million Belgians had crossed into the Netherlands as refugees. The task of guarding the porous border tied down many German soldiers, soldiers who were desperately needed elsewhere. When the war began in August 1914, it was greeted with great enthusiasm by millions, who expected that it would last for only a few weeks or months at most, and would be over by Christmas. Instead the conflict turned into a horrific bloodbath, it stalemated in attritional combat in the trenches of the Western Front. 
which stretched for hundreds of miles from the Swiss border to the North Sea, so the Germans racked their brains to come up, with ways to economize on the manpower necessary to guard the Belgian-Dutch border, the results were tragic for many. Number 16. The Tragic Wire of Death Early in 1915, the Germans erected an electric fence along a stretch of the Swiss border, in order to isolate some Alsatian villages from Switzerland, and it proved effective, so they decided to replicate it on a grander scale. Along the border between German-occupied Belgium and the neutral Netherlands, construction commenced in the spring of 1915, of an electric fence that stood 5 to 10 feet high, and covered over 125 miles of the Belgian-Dutch border from the Skelt River to Aix-la-Chapelle, it was charged with 2,000 to 6,000 volt wires that ran through it. Those caught within 100 to 550 yards of the fence, who could not explain their presence were summarily shot, by war's end, about 3,000 people had been killed along what came to be known as the Wire of Death, and newspapers in the southern Netherlands carried almost daily reports of unfortunates who had been lightning to death. Nonetheless, while the fence reduced border crossings, it did not eliminate them, Many managed to cross the border with creative methods such as tunnels beneath the fence, the use of extra high ladders, pole vaulting over it, or tying porcelain plates to their shoes in order to insulate them. Number 15. The Horrors of the Great War's Mud The Great War, or World War I as it became known after it was followed by an even greater just two decades later, was a tragic, horrific, and brutalizing experience for the millions of soldiers who found themselves stuck fighting in it. For those engaged in the 1917 Battle of Passchendaele, in Flanders, stuck took on a literal meaning, when unusually wet weather conditions morphed much of the region, into a sea of mud deep enough to swallow soldiers, and even horses. Flanders is a low-lying coastal region along the North Sea in Belgium, where the water table is seldom far below the ground, the area is naturally prone to muddiness, but 1917 saw relentless rains that enhanced its already muddy norms, artillery barrages churned the ground and made it even muddier. Thousands of horses and mules died from exhaustion as they tried to drag gun carriages and wagon loads through the mire, and sometimes it took over six hours to move an artillery piece a mere 250 yards. Number 14. Mud made the already tragic and miserable conditions of World War I trenches even more miserable and tragic. Stuck in the mud of Flanders, amidst the Battle of Passchendaele, it often took six men to stretch a single casualty over the muck, Men stumbled through glue like mud that sucked the boots from their feet, and that was often as deep as their waists or deeper. Soldiers no longer thought of those indifferent uniforms as the enemy, that honor or dishonor, went to the deep and all-devouring mud. Wounded men often faced a tragic end, when they were swallowed up by the slime, and hail men were frequently buried when sodden trench walls collapsed around them. Soldiers came to fear the mud even more than they feared their opponents' shells, bullets, and bayonets, as a British officer described his men suffering, covered with mud, wet to the skin, bitterly cold, stiff and benumbed with exposure, cowed and deadened by the monotony of 48 hours in extreme danger, and by the constant casualties among their mates, they hung on to existence by a thin thread of discipline rather than by any spark of life, some of the feebler and more highly strung deliberately ended their lives. Number 13. When French settlers in Algeria were angered by the native celebration of the end of World War II, World War II in Europe ended on May 8, 1945, with Germany's surrender, it was a day of celebration in the victor nations, but the celebrations took a tragic turn in the French colony of Algeria. In the eastern Algerian town of Sedif, thousands of native Algerian men, women, and children, held a parade to commemorate the victory, over 200,000 Algerians had been conscripted by their French colonial overlords during the war, and the marchers planned to lay a wreath at a monument erected in honor of Algerians killed in the conflict. However the parade, whose numbers included many Algerian veterans recently returned from the front lines, angered French settlers and French police. The French feared both the march's undertones of Algerian nationalism and the assertion of a right to equality with French settlers. Algeria was considered a part of metropolitan France, but it was governed with a form of apartheid, in which French white settlers were privileged above native Algerians. Any attempt by the natives to seek equality with French settlers was bound to upset the latter, and when that happened in Sedif, things took a horrific turn. Number 12. Victory celebrations took a tragic turn. Roughly 5,000 native Algerians marched in Sedif to celebrate the end of World War II, and some of them carried placards that stated we want equality, and end the occupation. Others called for the release of Algerian political prisoners held by the colonial authorities. 
when the marchers with placards refused to get rid of them, French settlers and police opened fire on the unarmed crowds. The result was an outbreak of riots, followed by attacks on French settlers throughout the region, in which about 100 were killed. The head of the French government in metropolitan France, General Charles de Gaulle, ordered the colonial authorities in Algeria to restore order by all means possible. The French military responded to the unrest in Sedif, with a campaign of collective punishment that entailed the indiscriminate use of heavy weapons of war against Algerian civilians. From the sea, French battleships and cruisers opened fire on native Algerian neighborhoods in Sedif and its surrounding environs. From the air, French dive bombers struck and flattened over 40 Algerian villages. Number 11. The French indulged in violent reprisals at Sedif. After the unrest was suppressed in the Sedif region and order was restored, French authorities carried out brutal reprisals against native Algerians, French soldiers performed a raticage, or raking over of Algerian rural communities suspected of involvement in the unrest, in which thousands were shot in summary executions simultaneously. French settlers went on a vigilante rampage in which they lynched Algerians seized from local jails, randomly shot natives out of hand, tortured them to death, or doused them in fuel and set them on fire. Humiliation routinely accompanied the repression, Algerian men were frequently forced to kneel in front of a French flag, then made to shout we are dogs before they were led away, never to be seen again, by the time the violence finally came to an end weeks later, thousands of Algerian natives had perished. The exact numbers are unknown, but most historians put the death toll of the tragic events at Sedif within a range of 6,000 to 20,000, while some contemporary news sources put the figure as high as 45,000. Number 10. The Tragic Fate of the Congo under King Leopold II King Leopold II of Belgium is not one of the first names most people associate with massive atrocities, however, his name belongs in the same league as Hitler, Stalin and Mao from 1885 to 1908, Leopold ran a colonial empire so vile and cruel that it rivals or exceeds the worst of most 20th century monsters. The Belgian king's colonial victims numbered in the millions, with 10 million dead the most commonly cited figure, although some scholarly estimates go as high as 15 million. It began in 1885, when Leopold painted himself as a humanitarian philanthropist and convinced other European powers then gathered at the Berlin Conference to award him a large state in Central Africa so they gave him what is today's Democratic Republic of the Congo. That was tragic for the locals. Leopold named the new colony the Congo Free State. It did not belong to Belgium, but was Leopold's private property, and he squeezed the locals hard to enrich himself. He did not uplift the natives and develop the region as he had promised. Instead, he transformed his African possession into a living nightmare that claimed millions of lives in widespread atrocities that came to be known as the Congo Horrors. Number 9. Leopold II promised to end slavery in the Congo, then allied himself with its biggest slaver. King Leopold II consolidated his power in the Congo River Basin, through an expedient alliance with a powerful Arab slave trader named Tipu Tip. That was awkward, given that the Belgian monarch had convinced the Berlin Conference to award him the Congo with a promise that he would combat its endemic slave trade. Leopold made Tipu a provincial governor in the eastern Congo, and gave him a free hand in exchange for the slaver's promise not compete with the king in the western Congo. Unsurprisingly, Tipu ramped up his slaving activities in his province, until Leopold, under pressure from European public opinion, turned on his slaver ally. He double-crossed Tipu, and raised a mercenary force that expelled him from the Congo. Leopold then reorganized his mercenaries into an occupation army named the Force Publique, and turned it loose to visit a reign of terror and horrors upon the natives. The result was the transformation of the Congo into a massive dystopian plantation, and the Congolese into Leopold's de facto slaves. Number 8. The Congo Horrors in Action Under the rule of King Leopold II, Congolese natives were given quotas of rubber, ivory, diamonds, or other goods to produce. Men who fell short of their quotas were mutilated by having their hands or feet amputated. If a man escaped, or it was deemed necessary that he keep his limbs, in order that he continued to produce for the Belgian king, Leopold's goons would mutilate his family instead, and amputate the hands of his wife and children, millions ended up mutilated for failure to meet production quotas. Millions more were murdered, starved, worked to death or perished from various forms of mistreatment and misgovernment. Numerous villages were wiped out when they dared to protest the colonial tyranny with all their inhabitants massacred when the Belgian monarch was awarded the Congo in 1885.
it contained an estimated 20 million people, when a census was conducted in 1924, that figure had fallen to 10 million, the exact number of victims is unknown and likely unknowable, but with estimates going as high as 15 million deaths, Leopold II qualifies as one of history's worst monsters. Number 7. The residential school scandal was not the only tragic event that involved Canadian authorities and children. The indigenous residential school scandal was not the only the tragic event visited upon Canadian children by the authorities in the 20th century in a bit to curb an admittedly problematic religious sect. Canadian officials forcibly seized its members' children, separated them from their families, and raised them in foster care or state institutions. Their targets were the Daukobers or Spirit Warriors, a pacifist and anti-materialist Russian Christian sect that formed in the 17th century. Their belief that a divine spirit resides in everybody raised eyebrows in Russia. What got them in serious trouble, however, was their penchant for nudity to emulate Adam and Eve, a tendency to swap wives, plus a notion that nobody has any right to worldly goods, the result was centuries of persecution, officials especially detested the Daukovers' pacifism, which led them to refuse conscription into the Russian military. The persecution's intensity waxed and waned over the years, and ranged from beatings to imprisonment to exile to death. In the 19th century, the Daukovers won Leo Tolstoy over as a patron, but his patronage was not enough to shield them, so they headed to Canada. Number 6. The start of the tragic chain of events that got the spirit warriors in trouble in Canada. Early in the 20th century, the Daukovers emigrated to Canada in search of religious freedom. Things began well, the misunderstanding soon set in motion a tragic chain of events. The end result was that the spirit warriors morphed in Canada from an odd sect and into a dangerous one, famous for mass nudist protests and infamous for arsons on a massive scale. The Daukovers first arrived in Saskatchewan in 1902, their immigration facilitated by Leo Tolstoy and the Society of Friends, or Quakers. At first, the Canadians saw the industrious spirit warriors as ideal settlers. At the time, the Canadian government granted 160 acres of land for a nominal fee of $10 to any male homesteader, provided he established a farm within three years. However, because of their religious beliefs, the new arrivals could not swear allegiance to the crown, that disqualified them for the land grants, which they viewed as a breach of promises made by the authorities. Embittered, they trekked to British Columbia, where they established drab little communal villages. Number 5. A Quaker like Al-Qaeda on the Canadian Prairie The spirit warrior's leader, a charismatic figure named Peter Verigan, maintained a semblance of control over his nudist followers by flogging them with brambles, then some Daukovers blew him up with dynamite in 1924, with their leader's demise. The spirit warriors fractured into rival factions, and things swiftly spun into a downward spiral of crazy. After Verigan's assassination, a radical splinter broke off from the Daukovers. This radical splinter of what was already a radical splinter of the Russian Orthodox Church eschewed the modern world. More accurately, they eschewed what little there was of the modern world in the Canadian sticks. Where they dwelt, they encouraged their brethren to avoid the trappings of modern society and everything, from the exploitation of animals to the use of electricity. In a tragic twist, their encouragement went beyond the adoption of a simple life for themselves. Like a deranged Quaker Al-Qaeda in Canada's back of beyond, they paraded new to emulate the simple lives of Adam and Eve, and terrorized, burned the homes, and destroyed the material goods of other Daukovers, who dared partake of modernity. Number 4. In a tragic twist, spirit warriors began to persecute other spirit warriors. The Canadian authorities had their hands full, trying to deal with the radical Russian religious migrants. Mass nude parades would probably raise eyebrows today. Back in the early 20th century, the Daukober Splinter Faction, who eventually named themselves the Freedomites, shocked sensibilities when they conducted mass protests in the buff. In one nudist epidemic, police sprinkled itching powder on the protesters. In 1932, the Canadian Parliament criminalized public nudity, and the courts began to penalize the spirit warriors' naked protests with prison sentences of about three years per offense. When yet another mass nude march scandalized British Columbia in 1932, over 600 Daukober men and women were banished to serve prison terms in Piers Island, BC in a way, the naked protesters' passive resistance exasperated Canadian authorities like Gandhi's passive resistance exasperated the British in India at the time. More worrisome and tragic, however, was when the Freedomites went from passive protest and began to actively persecute other Daukovers. Specifically, those whom they judged to have become too worldly, and to have abandoned the simple life appropriate for spirit warriors. <laughs>
Number 3. To curb the radical spirit warriors, Canadian authorities seized their children. Time after time, Freedomites raided the villages of other Dao Cobras to burn their homes, and dynamite their factories to punish them for straying from the simple life. For decades the Freedomites waged a virtual guerrilla war in British Columbia against the modern world, and especially against other spirit warriors they viewed as backsliders. From 1923 to 1962, the Freedomites were responsible for over 1,100 bomb and arson attacks. The authorities fought back with harsh sentences of up to three years imprisonment for nude protesters, and seized the sex children, separated them from their families, and sent them to be raised in foster care or at state institutions. The violence continued however, and culminated in a series of 259 bombings in 1962. In just one region of British Columbia, targets included ferries, railways, power lines and stations, hotels, courthouses and the destruction of entire villages. The authorities finally decapitated the sect in March 1962, with the arrest of 60 of its leaders, whom they charged with conspiracy to intimidate the Canadian Parliament and the legislature of British Columbia, with their leaders locked up. The rest of the spirit warriors rapidly assimilated into Canadian society, relative peace has reigned since, and Canadian Dalcober numbers dwindled from a peak of 40,000 in the 20th century to about 2,200 in 2011. Number 2. The Tragic Fate of Quebecois Orphans in the Care of the Catholic Church Tragic as the Canadian authorities' handling of Indigenous and Dalcober children was, for sheer venality, those episodes are eclipsed by the authorities' handling of what came to be known as the Duplessis Orphans, until the mid-20th century. The Catholic Church held significant, and sometimes pernicious, sway over Quebec. The 1940s and 1950s in particular were an era of widespread poverty, few social services and church predominance. In those dark days, Maurice Duplessis, a strict Catholic became Premier of Quebec. He immediately proceeded to place the province's schools, orphanages and hospitals, in the hands of various Catholic religious orders. He then hatched a scheme with church authorities to gain the Canadian federal government subsidy assistance program to the provinces. The idea was to divert as many taxpayer dollars as possible into the coffers of Quebec's Catholic Church. Canada's federal subsidy program incentivized health care and the construction of hospitals, more so than other social programs and infrastructures, Provinces receive a federal contribution of about $1.25 a day for every orphan, but more than twice that, $2.75, for every psychiatric patient. So Duplessis and Quebec's Catholic Church decided to transform $1.25 a day orphans into more profitable $2.75 a day psychiatric patients. Number 1. When the church and a dirty politician conspired to ruin the lives of orphans for money, in order to exploit the Canadian federal government's subsidy program, Duplessis and Quebec's Catholic Church conspired to turn orphans into psychiatric patients, to implement their idea and siphon more federal subsidy dollars into the church's coffers. They set up a system to falsely diagnose orphans as mentally deficient. As a first step, Duplessis signed an order that instantly transformed Quebec's orphanages into hospitals that entitled their religious order administrators, and ultimately the Catholic Church of Quebec, to receive the higher subsidy rates for hospitals. It took decades before the tragic and scandalous state of affairs was finally uncovered by then. Over 20,000 otherwise mentally sound Quebecois orphans had been misdiagnosed with psychiatric ailments once they were misdiagnosed. The orphans were declared mentally deficient. It was not just a paperwork technicality. Once misdiagnosed as mentally deficient, the orphan schooling stopped, and they became inmates in poorly supervised mental institutions. There, the children were often subjected by nuns and lay monitors to physical, mental and sexual abuse. 